Well, good morning. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to all of our members and visitors. I'm very thankful to be able to stand before you today and present to you a lesson from the Word of God. I don't presume to be a professional speaker like Brother Bill. You're not going to hear a a professional lesson. And Bill has no worries about someone taking his place. I hope you will listen attentively to the lesson that's being presented so that you will gain a, a understanding from the Word of God. It is my intention to preach the Word of God so that we can have a better understanding of what God wants us to learn from his word. That's the intention here, for us to worship God and his word as we study together. Our lesson today will be about, uh-oh. Oh, it's working. Will be about fellowship will be about the household of God. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it reads, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. From the very beginning, the church practiced fellowship. And we're going to explore what the Bible says about the church and fellowship and see how we can apply this to us today so that we can better ourselves. That's not to say that this church is doing poorly in fellowship. It's just to say that we want to do better and we want to build the church up and that we want to be strong, a strong congregation, and please God, and build the congregation up in love. And I want to take us back in time to the, the first church and see what the church was like, what those brethren were like. What was the church like? In James chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? We see that the church consisted mainly of the poor, that God actually targeted the poor to hear the gospel and they responded to the gospel and Jesus had that target also Jesus taught using parables about farming the things that the poor people would know about in Matthew 11 verses 4 and 5 he gave a report to the disciples of John the Baptist he said go and report to John what you hear and see the blind receive sight the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. The poor have the gospel preached to them. That we see Jesus targeted the poor, and they responded. They responded to the gospel more than other people, more than the rich, more than the wealthy. Many poor were, were just poor farmers. And we, we use the term that uh, we use today, the peasant farmers, in a generic sense. <clears throat> Jesus taught parables about laborers in the vineyard in Matthew chapter 20. These men had no jobs. They waited in the marketplace for someone to hire them to go work on the, in the vineyards, in the farms. And... Um, that related to these poor people who didn't even have a job, that they were waiting 
in the marketplace for someone to hire them. And also back in James chapter 5 and verse 4, in relation to the rich people who Jesus condemned, or who the writer condemned here, James condemned, he says, Behold, the pay of the laborers, once again referring to the people who had, who had to work in the fields, the laborers who mowed your fields, by which and which you ha have been con withheld by you, cries out against you, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. So many of the poor people worked in the fields for wages. And he condemns those who were rich, who withheld their pay from the poor people. And I didn't, didn't uh, advance a slide. Here's a slide of harvesting, the, the uh, wheat harvest in the ancient times, where they do the threshing and the wheat harvest. And what I'm getting to here is that in ancient times, what you had is that the church consisted of poor families who worked together and they worshiped together. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, our theme for the year, so then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of faith. What's the church compared to? The church is compared to a family, the household of faith. And again in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. God's household. We are the household of God. In 1 Timothy 3, in verse 15, But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So when we think of the church, God has modeled the church after the family. The church is not supposed to be an institution, a business. The church is supposed to be the family of God, modeled after the family. The church, in the early church, families were large by design. The church on, on, the, on the farm there had to be large to work the farm. They stayed in one place. And they work together and they worship together. And so the church was like that. The church was the family of God, the spiritual family of God, who stayed together, they worshiped together, and they were a family. Jesus also viewed the church as the family of God with God as our Father. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 50, he said, For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. All of the church, Jesus said, are brothers and sisters. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Those in the church are all in the scriptures are referred to as brethren, as brothers, as sisters. The church is the family of God. The church is called the brotherhood. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17 says, Love the brotherhood. In the early church, brethren had fellowship with each other. Poor families uh, stayed together. They knew each other. Society, society was built on the family unit. Fellowship worked because fam the family unit was strong and families socialized with each other. People didn't live in cities. There was no such thing as big cities. 
there were villages, small towns, and there was the family. And we have, referring back to the first verse, the first uh, verse that we referred to, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals with gladness. They, this is the fellowship that the church had, is that they had this fellowship with each other. This is the, the church was a family of God. Christians practiced hospitality. 1 Peter 4, verse 9, they were uh, admonished to be hospitable to one another without complaint. We see this throughout the, the scriptures. Aquila and Priscilla offer the use of their home for the work of the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. Romans chapter 12, verse 13 also admonishes the Christians to contribute to the needs of the saints practicing hospitality. And this is the way the world was. For a long, long time, the world stayed the same for a long, long time. From ancient times up until about the 1700s, the world was about the same. Did you ever realize this? The war, it was called like an agrarian society. That meant the world revolved around agriculture. Families worked the farm. And there were big families, like I said, who worked the farm. And you had to stay on the farm. You had to have this large family to stay on the farm and work the farm. That's the way the world worked for a long, long time. And of course, people were poor, very poor. And it was a very hard way of life. But the one thing that was good about it, I think, was the family. Families were large, they stayed together, they worshiped together. But something changed. About the 1700s, something came along, and there were some good things that happened. But uh, agriculture methods changed, and world population started to grow because there was more food. Cities were born because ways of manufacturing started to improve. There was no longer people made things by hand. You had factories that produced, mass produced goods and cities were, grew up. Now there were cities and there were jobs in the cities. So people moved off the farm. Families became mobile. People moved to where there were jobs. And the result, one of the negative results, was, was that the family unit was no longer together. You no longer had extended families working together. People moved to where the jobs were. And you have this picture of what started the Industrial Revolution was the mass production of textiles. The, the, uh, this is what happened, started in England and spread to uh, the rest of the world eventually. And so what you had was people didn't live this simple life any longer. And it led to a lot of good things. Look at the way we live now. We have a very wealthy society. Very wealthy society. We no longer have people who are destitute and poor all over the world. But it has led to some negative things as well. We look at 
our life today with all the good things that have happened and I there are a lot of great things that have happened and all this is I think has been brought about by God but there are some negative things that have happened and some of the, a lot of the negative things has been about the family more than half of the homes today there is divorce separation or single parent family then people move People are, this is a mobile society, mobile society. About 11% per year, or it varies, of course. 36 million people per year move. That's a lot of people. For various reasons, because of a job, need a bigger home, and various other reasons. The family is no longer what it was. Or a mobile society. We isolate ourselves in our home. Where it's no longer an the, the, the family togetherness like it was in general. But now, when the children grow up, they're no longer needed to work a farm. So when, when uh, the children grow up, they go out on their own. Maybe move to another state where the job is. And so we're isolated from each other. And then we have all the other things that isolate us. Technology. Sit at, at, the, at the table. Each one has his own uh, technological device. His own iPhone or laptop or whatever. iPad. They don't communicate with each other. We are isolated in our world today and not connected like we're supposed to be. And it happens to the church as well. It used to be where the church was a family. But now, sometimes people come to church and it's like entertainment. It's like a movie theater. You come to be, to watch and be entertained. Well, what can I get out of it? What's in it for me? Am I getting what I'm supposed to be getting? Like, like it's a movie. Like it's an entertainment. And you're not here to worship God. You're not here to have a connection with God above and with your brethren here. It's supposed to be the family of God where you have fellowship with God above and fellowship with your brethren here. And so fellowship doesn't just end here with our worship. Worship is extremely important, but that's not where our connection begins and ends. We're family, so it's not just here. This is important. This is really important because we are in the presence of God to worship Him, to learn and study. This is not where it ends. We come here to worship and study the Bible. That's not enough. We need more time together to build up our bonds of love and attachment much more so because we don't we have this technological mobile society that we become accustomed to we don't have that bond of the family like it used to be in society so we need to build up our bonds of love and attachment because we are brothers and sisters. We are the family of God. We need to practice hospitality so that we can strengthen and comfort one another. We have the commands to strengthen and comfort one another. If we are not building up that bonds of family, how can we do that? The scripture, Hebrew chapter 12, verse 12, therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, who comforts us, talking about God, who comforts us 
in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in affliction with the comfort with which we comfort ourselves, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. If we are not a family with bonds of connection, of affection, then how are we going to do that? If we don't know each other, we can't. We can't strengthen and comfort each other. We can't do that if we're not. We don't have bonds of affection, and we don't know each other. We can't do these things. The family of God need, needs to know and love each other. We are the body of Christ. Every member needs to be a part to build, needs to do their part to build up one another. Ephesians 4 and verse 16, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. The body needs each part, each member to do its part so that we can have the functioning of the body of Christ. We are called to follow Jesus. We're called to follow Jesus. Since you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his, ste in his steps. We're not to be people who are isolated. Jesus calls us to off our couches of ease and out of our houses. You know, we're not the, the poor, destitute people. We are a wealthy society. We have all this leisure time. We have all this time that we spend on ourselves. We've got all these electronic devices, we've got our iPhones, and we've got our computers, and we've got our television, and all these kind of things. All this me time. How about we do some other time? Other people time. So that we can do what Jesus tells us to do. We are called to serve. Our theme for the year. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those of the household of faith. There is someone who you need to get to know better. They are your brother or sister in Christ. Practice hospitality. Invite them to your home. You need to get to know your family, your spiritual family in Christ. There's someone here you need to get to know better. They're your family. And there is someone here who needs your help today. Your brother or sister having spiritual trouble. Go visit them. Tell them you care about their soul salvation. Or send them a card or a or give them a call so that you will fulfill the law of Christ by being an active member of the body of Christ. What it also says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that, you, so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thus and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. We are a family. We are the household of God. We are to get to know each other. We are to be 
building up the body of Christ so that God will be pleased in all respects. The church is the family of God. <clears throat> Salvation is found only in Christ, in the family of God. The body is his church. There is no spiritual life outside of Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In Him, in Christ, we have redemption through the, His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the kind intention of His will. Jesus said, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 after the brethren there heard that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, they said, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, <clears throat> It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So a person needs to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They need to repent of their sins. They need to confess that Jesus is Lord and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of the sins. In that way, you have entrance into the family of God and have hope of eternal life. There is no hope, there is no forgiveness outside of Christ. This puts a person into the body of Christ where all spiritual blessings are. They are born again into the family of God. We are so blessed to be members of the family of God. Let us remember that always. Let us praise God and let us try to be good to our brothers and sisters in Christ so that God will be praised always. If you're here and you're not a member of the family of God, you're not a Christian, you haven't obeyed the gospel, you can do that today so that you can have your sins forgiven and be a member of God's family. If you're subject to the gospel invitation, would you come to the front and have a seat as together we stand and sing? I am reading.